Happy to be joined by Jimmy Johnson uh, to discuss his new book, Swagger, written with Dave Hyde. And Jimmy, I want to start by talking about something that I always felt was a hugely important part of your success that is all over this book. And that is the fact that when you're the leader of a team or the leader of anything, confrontation is important and you reminded me a lot of bill parcells because early on in your tenure in dallas because that's the way parcells was and just you know you tell this story in the book but you early on because i covered you a lot you were a, a rising star your team was great and one time we were together after a game and you said to me Peter, if you fuck me on this story, I will squash <laughs> you like a squirrel in the road. <laughs> but I actually, you probably think, oh boy, I put him in his place. I actually loved it yeah. because it showed me that this is how you kind of operate. And this is how you have to operate in the high stakes world of the NFL. I want you to explain to me where you learned that and how it became a part of your ethos. Peter, I, I, I think not only confrontation, uh, but interaction. Uh, I visited with Brian Dable, who's doing a great job with the Giants, uh, before the season started. And I told him, I said, you know, and I told other guys that became a head coach for the first time, I said, you know, you're an offensive coordinator. You walk down that hall, and really nobody gave a damn. Nobody paid attention to you. I said, but now you walk down that hall, every head will turn. Yeah. You know, and if you're going to have a successful organization, it, it won't be just the X's and O's. You've got to have interaction with the secretary, the administrative assistant, the backup offensive guard, the intern coach. Because let me tell you, no one likes to be ignored, but especially no one wants to be ignored by the leader. And Brian even said, he said, I I take pizza down to the equipment people, you know, just to get the whole building on the same page. You know, people used to talk when we were in Dallas and we were one in 15. You know, they said, you know, somebody would complain to one of the coaches and they say, hey, this is the way Jimmy wants to do it. This is the way we're going to do it. There was never a chink in our armor. We were always on the same page. Kind of what Parcells used to say, one voice. You know, that's the way it is. And if everybody believes the same way, uh, and obviously there's interaction, you know, suggestions, go it this way, go it that way. But when you have an end result, that we're all working together, you know, for a common goal. You know, I thought there are three or four things in this book that I just simply did not know and which I found really, really interesting. I knew that you sort of had a rough relationship with Don Shula, but I didn't realize how it originated. And it actually originated with his son, Dave Shula, where you, in fact, kind of demoted Dave when you were in Dallas and you called Don as sort of a courtesy yes. on this. And uh, tell me the story and also sort of tell me where you think it all went wrong with Don Shula. Well, you know, I really didn't know him that well. Um, you know, I'd gone to a couple of his practices when I was at University of Miami. And so I wanted to hire Dave Wanstead. And Dave had taken a job with Don. So I went to, and talked to Don and said, I want to hire Dave Wanstead off your staff. And, he, you know, right off the bat, he didn't know that there was going to be a change in Dallas. He said, well, Tom Landry, I understand he's had three straight losing seasons, but what about Tex Schramm? Because Tex was a buddy of his. I said, I don't know anything about Tex. You know, Jerry's going to have to make the decision on that. I said, but I want to hire Dave Wanstead. He said, well, he said, how about Wanstead and my son, Dave Shula? And, I, you know, I kind of got the message, and so I hired Dave. And so after the second year, you know, I ended up being coach of the year in, in that second year because we nearly made the playoffs. And I wanted to hire North Turner. 
And so I called Don out of a courtesy. I said, you know, uh, I'm going to have Dave do be our passing coordinator and work, you know, with the receivers. And Don was, oh, man, I, I thought he'd be okay with it. But he said, hey, you know, Dave, big part of you becoming coach of the year, you know, and you can't do that. And he was, he cussed me out. And so I uh, end up, he worked with the Bengals and got Dave head coach there with Cincinnati. So it never was a problem. But then, you know, he kind of thought that maybe I ushered him out of the Dolphins, which I had nothing to do with. I mean, I was happy, happily retired down the Keys. Yeah. And Nick Bonacani called me and said, Hey, you know, Shula's out uh, with the Dolphins. I said, really? I didn't know that. And he said, have you talked to Wayne Heisig? I said, I've never talked to him. I don't even know him. And so Eddie Jones, the general manager of the president, called my attorney, Nick, and said, hey, you know, Wayne Heisig, I would like to talk to you. This is after Shula had left. And, you know, obviously I took the job. You know, Don not only was upset about me not keeping Dave as an offensive coordinator, but he was upset thinking I ushered him out of the Dolphins. The amazing thing you 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 talk about when you got that job and he said to you when you saw him after that, you really effed up. Yeah. Because you didn't keep uh who was it? It was Troy Vincent and oh, somebody it was else. Brian Cox, it was Troy yeah. Vincent, it was uh there uh oh the, you know Vincent was the big one uh because he was really a great defensive back. But there was five players uh, that contracts were up. His last year, he had gone all out and yeah. it maxed out the cap to get Steve Etman and uh, Green, the tight end, and, and Buckley, the defensive back, on and on. And we were over the cap. And I couldn't keep any of those players. Uh, you know but, what I remember about that, Jimmy? Having talked to you around that time, I remember saying – Oh my God, the Tampa job is so much better than and the Miami right. job. <laughs> you yeah. were right. I wish yeah. I had listened to you. <laughs> but, 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 as you said, and I totally understood, when you have a quarterback, and look, Dan Marino wasn't what he had been physically, obviously, when you got there. But look, you, you, you know, it was. I didn't think it was a dumb idea at all to go to Miami because you could have struck gold with, yeah. with, with Dan Marino. If Dan would have been healthy, the only problem was Dan was injured every single year that I was there. The Achilles, yeah. uh, the shoulder, uh, both knees. You know, he couldn't even jog around the field because his knees were so bad. Yeah, I saw him at the Hall of Fame. I said, Dan... Yeah, how's everything going? He said, "Hey, I had both knees replaced." I said, "I wish you to replace those knees before I got the dolphin job." <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. But That's you know, fantastic. we went to the playoffs three straight years and won a couple of playoff games. Had the number one defense in the league, uh, but it was a disappointment that we didn't win the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the one other thing, the couple of other things that I, I mean, I had no idea that before the draft in 1998 that Archie Manning called you and said, essentially, do you think you could figure out a way to get, uh, <laughs> to get Peyton, you know, to be able to draft Peyton? Tell me that story because that is a great story in the book. Yeah. Well, Archie, you know, yeah, he knew that I was kind of a wheeler dealer anyway. Yeah. And, uh, and so I visited with him. Uh, the only regret I, I had is that uh, we just didn't have enough draft picks to move up to get him. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, that would have been great. And people say, well, what would you have done? Well, you know, Peyton would have been behind Dan, you know, but the way it worked out, you know, Dan, you know, missed games every year. And so Peyton would have been thrown into the lineup uh, right off the bat because, like I said, Dan was hurt every year. Do you ever wonder what would have happened if you were able to somehow wheel and deal your way up from 19 to number one? Uh, it would have taken a lot of draft picks. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, I came that close. You know, Belichick came that close to coming down and being my defensive coordinator. So we could wow. have had, we could have had Peyton Manning, 
uh, as a quarterback and Bill Belichick as my defensive coordinator. <laughs> what happened with Belichick? We talked back and forth because we were friends and, you know, we had done some dealings, you know, back when he was at Cleveland. And, you know, and he, as you know, he comes down here about every other year and we talk football. Uh, so we had a great relationship. Uh, but uh, he said, you know, hey, his allegiance to Parcells, you know, kind of was a swaying factor in going to with Bill rather than me. Yeah. Jimmy, uh, you know, there's there's tinges of Jerry Jones throughout this book. And I know that everybody is going to be trying to divine little clues about your relationship over the years. But and you write about this a little bit in the book. I, I thought right after that second Super Bowl that it was just different. You were just so much less happy. Yeah. After that second Super Bowl, the first one, you were euphoric. The second one, eh, you know, and you weren't really that concerned about your legacy and all that. And I wonder, now that you've had time, really 20 plus years, almost 30 years to really think about this, tell me why you think you and Jerry just butted heads so monumentally. Uh Peter, I, I think it came down to the contract. And the contract really was uh, Jerry's, you know, thought right off the bat. And because, you know, when he talked to me about going to the Cowboys and he was in the process of buying the Cowboys from Bum Bright, he said, Jimmy, he says, I'm going to handle all the financial. I'm going to handle all the business. You handle all the fo football. And I remember we were in Little Rock, and you know, in his vehicle, we were talking. He says, hey, if I do all the financial and the business dealings and you do all the football, we'll be back to back and we'll make sports history. Well, my attorney, Nick Kristen, he wrote up the contract that way, that I would be responsible for all football operations, players, trades. Uh, and, you know, Peter, you were down there. I mean, I was yeah. I was doing the trades and I was doing the, the draft. Well, that worked fine when we were losing. <laughs> then we started winning. And once we started winning, you know, Jerry came up to me and he said, you know, he said, Jimmy, he says, you know, we had a little conflict when I traded for Tony Casillas. And, you know, he was talking about how he traded for Tony Casillas. I said, you don't even know what position he plays, you know. And I said, you know, you know, Jerry, why? You know, and he said, you know, listen. I can make $5 million and nobody really gives a damn. He said, you trade for a backup offensive guard. And everybody goes, Ooh, wow. You know, he said, I want to be part of that. And so that's when I knew that things were going to be a conflict. So, but that way, that was the way my contract was written up. And that's what I was responsible for. Maybe if we had gone day one, Okay, Jerry, you're general manager. You you're responsible for this. You and Jimmy, you do the football coaching. And we, but that's not how we started. You know, there in in Dallas. Now we redid the contract about three different times, and I got more money. And he always wanted to take those, you know, terms out of the contract, and I never would allow him to take them out of the contract. Yeah. Were you that day in March of I guess ninety three? Were you utterly shocked when you heard what Jerry did at the league meetings, basically say some stuff about you that he could win the Super Bowl with 500 coaches and things like that? I have to imagine that no matter how difficult and contentious sometimes your relationship was, that that must have been a, a sock in the gut. Hey, Peter, it hurt. But I know, I mean, and you know, I, I live three blocks from the office. I mean, I put in five years there of doing nothing, sacrificing my family, you know, to try to rebuild the guy. Tom Landry's one of the greatest coaches ever, but he had three straight losing seasons, and they were the worst team in the NFL at three and 13. And so to take that team and to rebuild it, not only – into a Super Bowl winner, but the youngest team in the league to win the Super Bowl that was going to be really the team of the 90s. I was proud of that. And you know, I was proud of our accomplishments. And 
for him to say 500 coaches could win, you know, with that team, the only response I had was, yeah, but I, I was a big part of putting together that team. You know, maybe 500 couldn't do it, but maybe there's 20 or 30 could have won the Super Bowl with them. But I, I helped put that team together. And so it, it hurt. You know, I want to I want to end with uh, this story that you told in there that I had absolutely no idea about. And that is your relationship with your son, Chad, his problems uh, with alcoholism and what happened at the at the end with him. And. Jimmy, I, I mean, you always were just really all business. I know you had a family. I know you had, you know, your sons. And and there were times when I would see them around you. But I just never really thought of your family because you really made it all about football. And you separated, you know, your family life very much. There was a big line of demarcation there. But... Tell me about the problems that Chad faced. And I think you write about it really, really eloquently in the book. And it and you opened a vein and bled in this book about it. Well, there's a couple of things about the family. In fact, when I went to my mother's funeral and I couldn't look at her in the casket, you know, that's when I realized what I'd missed out on all those years. And that's what made me retire. But the situation with Chad is, you know, both both sons play football. I never saw either one of them ever play a game because I was always trying to win a championship. I always felt like I needed to outwork the opponent. And so I didn't even realize Chad was having a problem, but, you know, he became an alcoholic. And, uh, I mean... I could tell you stories that he went through that it just devastating that I didn't even know it was going on. And I'd lay in bed at night. He went to a couple of rehab centers and I'd lay in bed at night crying my eyes out and saying, I give a million dollars if somebody can get him back on track. And so when he absolutely did hit rock bottom, he, we got him into a halfway house and next thing he started getting better. He ends up, you know, taking over the halfway house. He took over the the whole facility. He went and got doctors and consultants, you know, to certified as a rehab center. And they became just unbelievably successful with Tranquil Shores. And I go back to their client reunion. He, he's got Tranquil Shores now. Now he's opening another one up in Austin. And I would go and I'd sit in the audience next to Chad And like a mother and daddy would go up to the podium, they'd have all the recovering alcoholics and all their families there. And the mother and daddy would say, Chad, thanks for saving my son's life. Wow. And then a mother would go up and she told this story, said, Chad, you picked up my daughter at three o'clock in the morning and drove her around for four hours talking to her and then took her to detox. Thanks for saving her life. I mean, I, I'm tearing up now just talking about it. And business have, have tried to buy Chad's you know, facility. He said, Daddy, he says, I'm not in it to make money. He said, if a business bought it, they'd have, you know, like one counselor for 10 or 20 clients. We have one counselor for every four clients. That's why we're successful. He said, I don't care about making money. I'm doing something to help people. I mean, it's such a success story that I'm so proud. I said, you know, I told the people when I talked to them, I said, listen, I had a couple of undefeated national championship teams as a player and a coach, won a couple of Super Bowls, college pro football, college and pro football Hall of Fame, broadcasting the Hall of Fame. Nothing that I've ever accomplished comes anywhere close to what you're doing is saving people's lives. And it, I mean, it's touching to me. It's awesome. It just really is awesome. And, you know, to think about you in 1990, 1991, 1992, how absolutely singular your focus was. It was only focused on one thing, you know, the Dallas Cowboys in winning. 
And right. to hear you say that now, you are a, just a different animal. Troy Aikman talked, one of my best friends, Troy talks about it all the time. He said, it's unbelievable. He says, you're a fun, good guy. <laughs> <laughs> Where was that guy when we were with the Cowboys? <laughs> <laughs> but Jimmy, I got to admit, you really did have an awful lot of fun. And, you know, like the way you the way you scouted players going around to college campuses and hanging out. I mean, you really. I think one of the reasons why you had the success you did is because of what you talked about at the beginning the sort of interpersonal communication and the fact that you were just as comfortable talking to your third string running back as you were talking to Paul Tagliabu. Right. You, you know, I mean, you could, that is a secret, I think, that really kind of tells the story of how you're able to be successful, I think. I, I think that's why people come down to the Keys, you know, general managers, owners, you know, coaches. Uh, Troy and, and Tony Wise and North Turner and Juan said, they, they were all down here, you know, just a few weeks ago. And they were saying, what, what made you so successful? And I don't know who said it, but he said, Jimmy brought out the best in everybody. Because, you know, all those guys, they didn't have a, big pedigree you know tony wise coach maybe the greatest offensive line ever in pro football and there were a couple of third round picks and a couple of free agents and tony was a guy that played at ithaca didn't actually play but he went to ithaca <laughs> and but he was a great offensive line coach and i brought out the best in tony as an offensive line coach yeah but i tried to bring out the best in everybody in the organization coaches players everybody and that's what made it fun, Peter. Jimmy Johnson, here it is. Super Bowls, Brass Balls, and Footballs, a memoir. Swagger. Jimmy, thanks so much for joining me, and good luck with the book. All right. Thank you, Peter. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.